guys can have a seat. Well, bon dia. Buenos dias. Bonjour. And good morning. And good morning. Welcome to Horizon West Church. It's a, it's, if I was Mr. Rogers, I would say it is a beautiful day in the neighborhood this morning. Um, some of you would have seen a, a picture that was floating around Facebook yesterday. We're actually dressed up as Mr. Rogers to promote the series that we're kicking off today. The series is called Hello Neighbor, and that's the extent to which it has any connection to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. So go ahead and just dismiss the rest of that. Uh, what the series really is about is how God's redemptive plan for mankind um, and the way that has impacted us as followers of Jesus should spill out of our lives, overflow from us into the lives of those closest to us, like our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our family members. And so that's really what the next few weeks are going to be about. Well, when I was in my mid-20s, I uh, was living in Augusta, Georgia. Um, Augusta is famous for what? The Masters, right? That's coming up in, I think, 10 days or something, 11 days. Um, it's a big golf tournament that happens there every year. Um, and it's, it's located at Augusta National, this beautiful, phenomenal golf course. Some of you have probably had a chance to see it. Um, where I lived uh, was an apartment complex that was about as close to the corner of Augusta, Augusta National as from here to the parking lot uh, out here. Uh, literally that close. Like it was, you know, if I had a good arm, I could have hit it with a rock kind of thing. Um, and it was called Madison on the Green. So I want you to picture what an apartment complex called Madison on the Green adjacent to Augusta National would look like. And then flip that upside down. And it's the opposite of that, okay? This was a broke down, run down, $450, I think $455, I counted the dollars, right? A month deal. Um, and so when you live in a place like that, you know, there's people around you sometimes that are kind of interesting. Th there was a, uh, and they would probably say the same thing, by the way, uh, about me. But uh, there was a couple that lived above me. You know, some of you live in apartments, and that's the worst, right? When you're like on the ground floor and people over you. And these people were always getting into domestic issues. I never actually met them, but one time I had to call the police on them, and I'm like, oh, I hope they don't know it was me. Like, this is going to be so awkward. Uh, but they were up, uh, uh, upstairs, and then to my right was a guy named Mac, and Mac ha had served in the military, but he kind of drunk his way out of it, if you know what I mean. Um, and so he just was crashing at this cheap apartment complex in Augusta, um, and I had tried to build a relationship with Mac, and he finally agreed to go to church with me on the premise that I would go with him to lunch at Hooters afterward. Now, I got counsel on whether or not I should share that detail of the story. I'm not prescribing that. I'm just telling you what I did as a 25-year-old to try to reach this guy for the Lord. And I'm telling you, when I walked in, I was like, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here. You know, that was just kind of what it felt like for me. But I got him to church. There was another guy, uh, Hank, who was much older. Hank was kind of a, a leftover from the 60s, right? Like when 1970 clicked, he, he never went into it. Like he stayed in the 60s. And uh, he wrote like beat poetry and he talked about like Jack Kerouac and Leonard Cohen, these guys like he knew them. I don't know if he did or not, but this was, and he's just a chain smoker. So I would sit in his apartment, just, just smoke, and I would just talk with him and try to share the gospel. I did eventually have opportunity uh, to share the plan of salvation with Hank um, and, and, and got that opportunity. But, you know, w one time I remember I, I walk outside and Hank's in his bathrobe and he's just like this and he's just looking at the trees in front of our apartment complex and he's kind of glazed over. I said, Hank, are you okay? He goes, I'm just... I'm just really concerned about God. It's like, Hank, what are you talking about? Like, that makes no sense. What do you mean you're concerned about God? Like, he had seen a tree fall, and he thought something was wrong with the cosmos. Like, that was his explanation. So, but that's just him. But these were the people around. And, and I'm just telling you that because I was like, we, we all live in places or have lived in places where we, where we have those neighbors, right? Like, the people that, that maybe they play their music too loud, or they party too late, or they drive too fast, and you just kind of go... Man, this neighborhood would just be better. This, this apartment complex would just be better. This dormitory would just be better if not for those neighbors. And I want to submit to you this morning that those neighbors, along with every neighbor, every coworker, every friend and family member that you have in your life, is there not by accident, but by God's strategic purpose. And the purpose is so that you, as a follower of Jesus, might become a bridge and a conduit to them of the gospel that they might receive and respond to the good news of Jesus Christ in their life. Paul was a man in the, in the New Testament, the early church, that, that lived his life in this kind of way. Like Paul just believed whatever circumstance he was in had been ordered by God and he was there for a purpose. 
So Paul could be in a synagogue. Paul could be on a ship or in a ship that had been, that had been wrecked. Paul could be in a prison. And wherever Paul was, he was looking at the neighbors around him, the people that God had put in his life. At one time in Acts chapter 17, Paul finds himself in Athens, and there's a group of Athenians who are pagans, and they're worshiping these pagan gods. And by the way, they have one statue to an unknown god. And Paul goes, that's my opportunity. And Paul begins to talk to these people of Athens about the unknown god. See, they're just trying to cover their bases. Paul says, let me tell you about the god that you don't know. And as he gets into his talk in Acts chapter 17, verses 26 and 27, this this is how... Paul sets it up for them. And he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. See, sometimes we present the gospel and we put it in terms of distance. We'll talk about, oh, that uncle of mine is really far from the Lord. Or my little sister has strayed far from the gospel. But Paul would say, and I think scripture would teach us, that no one is far from God. The issue is not distance, it's direction. See, the issue is that we've got our backs turned to God. Our natural disposition is that we are not in relationship with God, not following after God. And so the invitation of the gospel is simply to turn. It's not to cover a lot of ground. It's not to go on a long journey to get back to God, but rather to turn, and God is there. He is near to us. He is drawing us. He is inviting us into relationship with him. And this is a fascinating presentation. If you were to read the whole thing that that Paul shared with the uh, people of Athens in Acts 17, because it's so very different than the way that his friend Peter presented the gospel in Acts chapter 2. See, see, 15 chapters earlier, Peter stands up at Pentecost, this huge Jewish holiday, and man, he just like hits them between the eyes with the gospel. He's talking about sin and the cross and the death, and he names Jesus of Nazareth, by the way, uh, uh, by name. And he says, by the way, guys, you crucified this Jesus, but God raised him up, and God set a day where he's going to judge the world, and it leaves these Jewish people at Pentecost saying, brothers, what must we do to be saved? But interestingly, Paul goes a different direction. See, these are people of Athens. These are people like potentially maybe some of your own neighbors or coworkers, People that have no concept of God, no concept of the gospel. And so rather than just hitting them between the eyes with it, Paul puts it in a context in which they'll understand. He never mentions the name of Jesus or the cross in this presentation. And so what happens is not the people go, brothers, what must we do to be saved? Because Paul hasn't gotten them there yet. But here is the response. It says that when Paul is finished speaking, some of them mocked him, but others said, we want to hear you again on the subject. See, the way that Paul engaged his neighbors, the people of Athens, with the gospel, the way he engaged them in the story of God's redemptive plan, left them curious and wanting more. And I just believe that your presence in the lives of people should leave them curious about the gospel, saying, Man, I want to know more about uh, this Jesus that you follow. I, I want to learn more about that church you attend because I see something in you and, and, I, and I'm watching something in your life, in your marriage, though it is far from perfect, that's different and something that I want for myself. So how do we get to this place of, of lostness and sin and Jesus and the resurrection? Well, to, to kind of really un fold this, we have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. And and we're going to look at a lot of scripture today, um, but I want to start here because this is the beginning. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 5 through 9. God has finished creating, this is what he says in in Genesis 2, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and watering the whole face of the ground, then The Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord made spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, God had placed mankind in what I would call the perfect neighborhood. That there's this beautiful, luscious garden that the man just gets to work in. And, and it's not humid, right? I know you can't imagine what a world like that would be like, but it's not humid. 
The man is enjoying cultivating the garden. There's beautiful trees and they're producing fruit that the man can enjoy freely. He is, he's enjoying this neighborhood that God has placed him in. There's no, there's no homeowners association. It's like the, the perfect ideal situation that he is finding himself in. And not only is it the perfect neighborhood, but he has the perfect neighbor, right? Like, how cool to live next door to God, right? The music's not too loud, doesn't drive too, like none of that stuff. Never have to call the police, like, right? It's just, it's God. That's his neighbor. And if you know the story and the way it unfolds, unfortunately, this perfect beginning had a very imperfect ending. The man and woman would choose their own way and break the relationship with God. And God, we're not going to go there this morning, but in Genesis chapter 3, after they have sinned and they've eaten from the tree that he told them not to eat, the one thing God said not to do, everything else is yours. And they choose their own way. And all of a sudden, God comes to them with a question in Genesis 3. He says, where are you? Now, God hasn't lost track of, of his creations, right? Like, he isn't like looking through the trees going, guys, where'd you go, you know? Ollie, ollie, oxen free, everybody can, you know, he's not. Like, he's not... What's happened is God is saying to Adam, look at where you are now in relation to me. Adam, you're hiding behind a tree. You have fig leaves sewn together to cover yourself. Like, where are you? Where have your choices, where has the the path you've chosen, where has it led you to? You know, some of the people in your life, they may not be asking themselves at the conscious level, but they're going, man, what happened? How did I end up in a marriage like this? How did I end up with with this addiction? How did I end up with these broken relationships? And and, and they're thinking that the cure is maybe a different uh, spouse or maybe a different job or maybe more money or or if I could just, but it's not any of that. There's something broken in relationship with God. It's like when your car alignment goes off, right? Anybody had that happen where you you let go of the steering wheel and it just starts drifting, right? Okay, or drifting left. Or sometimes you let it go long enough, you let go and it's like in a ditch. It just goes, boom, you know. Um, some of you have been there, right? And so you've got to constantly keep your hands on the steering wheel. And what happened in the garden, what happened with Adam and Eve when they ate of the tree that God said not to eat is the alignment of their soul got broken off. And all of a sudden, it's just every day they were just going the wrong way. The prophet said, all, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And so we find this at work within ourselves. And so God, unfortunately, had to trespass Adam and Eve from the neighborhood. It was not just that they lost their way from the place they were created for, but they lost their way from the person they were created to have fellowship with. And though the perfect neighborhood had been lost to them, fortunately, for them and for us, the perfect neighbor refused to give up on them. The Jesus Storybook Bible is a... a, uh, kind of a picture book with, with uh, words understandable to children. And it's a resource that my wife and I use with our kids and several of you do as well. The Jesus Storybook Bible, when it speaks to the issue of Adam and Eve's leaving the garden, I want you to hear the way it articulates it so beautifully. Before they left the garden, God made clothes for his children to cover them. He gently clothed them and sent them away on a, on a long journey, out of the garden, out of their home. Well, in another story, it would be all over, and that would have been the end. But not in this story. God loved his children too much to let the story end there. Even though he knew he would suffer, God had a plan, a magnificent dream. One day, he would get his children back. One day, he would make the world their perfect home again. And one day, he would wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see, no matter what, in spite of everything, God would love his children. With a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And though they would forget him, And run from him. Deep in their hearts, God's children would miss him always and long for him. Lost children yearning for their home. One of my uh, movies that I I love to watch is the movie Lord of the Rings. Some of you are are fans. That's also called nerds. But nonetheless, (laughs) I'll count myself among you. I gotta be honest, the first time I watched Lord of the Rings, I fell asleep because it's like a 17 hour movie. But but then I watched it again and I pieced it all together. And you know my favorite part of Lord of the Rings, it's, it's, it's not the battle scenes and all the, like, the, the wizardry and all that stuff. It's all cool. It's all good. For some reason, my favorite part of Lord of the Rings is the Shire. There's just something about the Shire. You know, the hobbits live in, and everything is just like green and peaceful. And, and the, as soon as they walk into the Shire, the music starts playing. And you're like, ah. 
And throughout the movie, you know, Frodo and, and Samwise and these guys, they're, they're longing to get back to the Shire. It's like this desire that's innate within them that they've got to fight their battles. They've they got to, you know, do the mission they were called to do. But one day, we're going to get back to the Shire and everything is going to be good again. Augustine said this, You have made us for yourself and our souls are restless till they find their rest in you. The writer of Ecclesiastes says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of man. There, there's something within us that's longing for God. And you go, man, not my neighbors. <laughs> not, not the people in my circle because, man, they want nothing to do with God. But can I tell you something? We're like children who are blindfolded and reaching out and looking. And we go, oh, oh that felt good. Oh, oh I, I, like, I like the way this made me feel. We're grasping for things, and we may be grasping and reaching the wrong things, but even the grasping and the striving is a longing for God that's in our hearts. He was, we, we are made in his image, and we are made for relationship with him. Richard Foster is a, a writer that I've read a ton of books on, one of my favorite theologians, um, and, and I love what he says about Scripture. He says the unif unifying theme of Scripture is God saying, I am with you, will you be with me? He calls this the Emmanuel principle, God with us. That, that from every page of scripture and the entire story when it's put together, the old covenant, the new covenant, all put together, is driving toward this one statement, I am with you, will you be with me? And so the garden is lost to Adam and Eve and they go on their way, but the story continues. It, it continues with a man named Abraham who's given the promise of becoming a great nation. It continues with a man named Moses who courageously leads the nation out of captivity in Egypt. With a woman named Hannah who cries out and is given a son, a prophet named Samuel. It continues with a boy named David who kills a, a giant with a sling and a stone. Through friends named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who survive a fiery furnace. And through a woman named Esther who boldly saves her people from annihilation. We, we see story after story of God showing up in the lives of people. But still, the world is not reconciled. It's still not restored to God's original intent. And so he sends prophets. The greatest of those is a man named Isaiah. His book lands kind of right in the middle of our Bibles. I, I want to share with you what Isaiah chapter 55, what Isaiah writes about this invitation that God has given to his people. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 3. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear to me and come to me, hear that your soul may live. See, there it is again, right in the heart of the Bible, this invitation. God is saying, come to me. You don't have to pay for it. Oh, somebody is going to pay for it. There is a cost to pay, but you can access this for free simply by coming and receiving what God is offering. Uh, that same prophet Isaiah earlier in his prophecy would, would talk about one day when a, a, a woman who was a virgin would give birth to a, a child and they would call his name Emmanuel. And that prophecy is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1 when the angel shows up to a young girl named Mary. And he says, you're going to call his name Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. He says, Here, here's what else. They'll call him Emmanuel because it means God with us. God would come into our neighborhood. And we would, for a little bit of time, for just a brief while, get to see what it looks like when God moves into the neighborhood. And we see it in Jesus Sick people are healed, and, and blind people see, and, and people who couldn't speak are shouting praise. People who couldn't walk are dancing. The, the, the poor are fed. Outcasts are, are welcomed. The legalists and the oppressors are silenced. And for a brief period of history, we saw what God with us looks like in the person of Jesus. But it was only a glimpse, because he had come to our neighborhood, but he had not yet brought us back into his Earlier in the week as I was preparing, I, I like to bounce things off Nikki because she's super wise and she keeps me sometimes from saying things that I shouldn't say and sometimes encourages me to tell stories like the one I told earlier that I might get in trouble for. That was her. And I said, Nikki, what are, what are some of the, and by the way, her parents are here this morning, so I, this, I probably shouldn't be sharing some of these things. Um, 
I said, Nikki, what are some of the situations that we found ourselves in? We've, we've known each other a little over 10 years and been married most of that time. Um, what, you know, and I don't think of ourselves as like really like risky people. We don't like jump out of planes and do this kind of stuff. So maybe we're just not real smart. Like we've gotten ourselves in some really, I, it ended up being like, well, there was this one time and you remember when we did that and then there was this. And so I said, well, I can't tell all these stories. But I want to give you a few ideas of some of the situations we've, we found ourselves in. So uh, in, in 2011, we were new at the church uh, at First Baptist Orlando, and, and we were taking our students on a mission trip to Jamaica. It was fantastic. Uh, but a couple months later, we did a follow-up trip, um, and we just kind of went out on our own. Like, we weren't with the same mission organization, and we had met some people down there, so we were just going down to visit. And so it was left to me to kind of plan this, which is not a good idea. And so I'm like, well, first thing, you know, we'll, we'll rent a car, um, and I'll, I'll drive the two hours from the airport to, to the place we're going in Jamaica. And uh, they speak English. That's like the national language, so we'll be fine there. That's, that's, that's not true. Like, it is, it is officially, uh, but nobody there speaks English, you know. And so um, also their cars drive on the wrong side of the road and on the wrong side of the car on the wrong side of the road. So we were headed for a real disaster and didn't know it. And so we get to Jamaica. It's like 10 o'clock at night. And my car uh, rental reservation didn't go through. So now we're in Jamaica with no transportation, two hours from where we're supposed to be. And nobody knows, like, th- that lives in Jamaica knows or cares that we're there. Like, we're just going down. And, and so, so, but it was kind of providential because I'm pretty sure I would have killed us if I tried to drive uh, through Jamaica, you know, on the wrong side of the road. And so it didn't work out. But now we're stranded. And so people are like, hey, come with us, come with us, you know. And so we find ourselves packed into a van with like 17 other people, and they're trying to get as much money out of everybody, so they're like, just hold your suitcases. We're like, you're not going to, no, you hold your suitcases. So we're holding our suitcases, and about 20 minutes in, this argument breaks out in Patois. I have no idea what they're saying, and it's scary, right? Like, uh, it's like one of those things, if it happened in America, you would expect somebody to die. Like, it was that level of intensity, and fortunately, we had our suitcases up, so we'd have been protected if they were, you know, but we're like, and so, but it was just super unnerving. We're like, you know, this probably wasn't a great idea. This, we, we could have planned this a little better. Um, another time we were in New York City for the first time and, and we wanted to go see the Yankees. I wanted to go see the Yankees play. And they happened to play in the Bronx. I'm like, well, let's just get there early and just kind of walk through the Bronx for a little while, right? <laughs> it's totally normal, right? <laughs> totally normal. Um, and sure enough, so we're like passing by this McDonald's. A fight had broken out and a guy was like, not breathing, and so police were trying to save his life doing CPR, but it was a really hostile and kind of volatile time in April of 2015, and so a crowd had come around and was like heckling the police, and so I was like, we shouldn't be here, like this is not good, you know, um, but we, we found ourselves, and there were, there were more, I could go on, I'm not going to go on. The point of it is this, uh, we tend all to have a naturally, uh, to, to naturally avoid risky situations, right? Like unless we're just not smart or we didn't think it through, we'll go, I'm going to choose the safe path over the not-so-safe path, right? But here's what's different about Jesus. Jesus did not come to earth in spite of the fact that it was unsafe. He actually came to our earth to die. He said, I have come to, not to be served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. See, we we tend to go into neighborhoods or or choose where we live based on a few really simple questions. Like, uh, is it safe? Do the neighbors look out for each other? And how are the schools? And we go, that's where, and and I just want to offer to you, could it be that there's something bigger going on, that there's a bigger reason that God has has put you on the earth than just to play it safe? But to say, man, there's a reason I'm in this neighborhood. It's not just because I had enough money to pull it off. It's not just because this person moved out and then I got the home. God has strategically uh, uh, located me here for a specific purpose. And what is that purpose? It's so that the good news of Jesus might flow through me to those around me. So next week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how this idea of gospel invitation, the, the way that Jesus and his first followers really turned the world upside down by simply inviting people into something called the good news inviting people to respond to Jesus. And that's going to be next week. But, but first, what we're going to do um, is, is we're going to see uh, that God's desire for reconciliation, that the Emmanuel principle, God with us, is really something that appeared all throughout Scripture. 
Although Jesus lived it out, God's heartbeat goes all the way from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, if you would, turn with me to Revelation 21, and I want you to hear what the culminating moment of the Bible, the culminating, culminating moment of human history is. And you're going to hear the same principle, that same idea show up. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. It's like the writer of Revelation is reflecting on this story that's been unfolding since Genesis And he's seeing this future moment in history in in the book of Revelation. He's going, finally, at last, God's desire has been fulfilled. Finally, God gets what he wants. He's with his people forever. He's their God. They're his people. They're with one another. That's the way God always intended it to be. And God is driving human history to that point of reconciliation. One of the things I find most beautiful about the gospel and it's embedded in that invitation, it's that it is for everyone. I have said to many people, we, we want to be a church not only for everyone, we want to be a church of everyone. Like, we don't want to just be a church that goes, yeah, you can come no matter who you are. No, we are those people. Like, we are every nation and language and tribe. That, that's what we strive to be because it reflects God's desire to bring people into relationship with himself. And so over the next couple weeks, we're going to look at what it means for those closest to us, but I don't want to overlook the fact it also means for those furthest from us, those least like us, those on the other side of the world or maybe on the other side of Orange County that, that, that maybe we wouldn't naturally interact with or engage with, but we know that this gospel invitation is for them. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. I've asked our, one of our missions leaders at our John Young campus, Patrick, I'm going to ask you to come up. Patrick Barrett uh, works on our missions team. He's a pastor at the church. Why don't you guys welcome him as he comes up and as we close. Because as we think about, as we think about this idea of taking the gospel beyond ourselves, into our neighborhoods, into our community, into Central Florida, uh, we have an opportunity coming up. It's called the Good Friday Project. And I've asked Patrick if he would just to share a little bit, 30-second nugget, what that is, and I want to have some conversation with you around it. All right, the 30-second nugget. The Good Friday Project is a partnership with the Orlando Union Rescue Mission. It's one of Orlando's uh, longest-standing organizations that serves uh, homeless and and folks living in poverty. Um, There are basically two parts to it. One is a shoe drive uh, where we're going to collect shoes uh, to serve the men and women as part of their Easter banquet. And then um, the second part is their Easter banquet on Friday, uh, uh, August 9th, or excuse me, it's Friday, April 19th, and uh, so Good Friday this year and an opportunity to serve. So shoe collection, shoe drive, and an opportunity to serve on Good Friday. Awesome, awesome. Um, so Nikki and I had the chance to bring the kids last year, um, and it was just an incredible thing. Uh, it, I, I wish I could give you a visual picture of this, but just this long line of mostly homeless people, and, 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 and they're waiting to get their feet washed and to get new shoes. They've had a meal, so we're, we're serving, we're, we're engaging with them that way. And uh, Nikki and I and the kids, we just kind of worked the line. We just kind of got to know people's stories and talked to them. Um, and, and it was an incredible experience. Tell me, um, Patrick, the, what, the why behind it all, kind of if you had to say this is the reason we're doing this. Um, what's the big picture? The reason we're doing this, I think, comes from probably 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, Paul gives this incredible picture of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And then uh, after that, he says, therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. Mm-hmm. If you look at Jesus' life, he found himself in some unusual places. Maybe not Hooters, I don't know. No, but, hopefully not. Uh, uh, he, Jesus uh, was even criticized for the people that he was around. And he, there was no brokenness that he wouldn't step That's into. Right. So for us, as his, his ambassadors, right. he came to serve, not to be served. And uh, so I think that's the why behind it is, is a desire to serve. That's right. Um, there was an interesting thing that happened last year that was a logistical challenge. It, but it, it was interesting to see how it played. But to, to share how, how that played out. So if you're going to wash feet, you need water. 
And uh, we had, and again, we're serving almost a thousand people. And so um, we go to turn the water on to fill the buckets to wash the feet. And the city had shut down a main a block away or something. So, so we started with no water. It was, uh, it was fun. And the solution? The solution was we gathered all the moms and we said, do y'all have baby wipes? And there you so go. We grabbed a bunch of baby wipes and we started and then the city got the water on. So the nice it was thing fun. Is you don't even have to ask moms. They have baby wipes. Like they've got them, you know. And by the way, John 13 in the original Greek, it says that when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he used baby wipes. So What's you were, the Greek word for that? It's, it's wipus, oh, I think wipus, is the word. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you guys are being very biblical in that approach. Um, one of the pictures, Patrick, and, and I want you to speak to, to this to a degree, um, you know, this long line of, of people, but, the, you know, there were people on our, from our John Young campus at the time, and, and Lord willing, this year from both campuses, that ranged from, you know, we, we, had, uh, we have a member at First Orlando who is homeless and knows that community. He was there washing feet, uh, not having his feet washed. He was serving his, uh, the people in his community. But then we also had individuals. I, I saw one in particular that stood out to me. And I know he's got a, a tens or maybe hundreds of millions of dollar company that he runs. He's a CEO. And he's just there on his knees, just washing the feet of a, of a homeless child. And I took a picture of him. I went, man, where, wh- like, in what other universe does this happen? other than somebody who's just overflowing with the love of Jesus and says that's what matters. Like more than any of the socioeconomic stuff, like this is what matters. Followers of Jesus serve. And so we know it's a benefit for those who are served, but talk about some of the benefit uh, for those who are participating in it. I think uh, just one quick example from last year, I'll never forget being done. We were wrapping up and there's a woman who had served. She came up to me and she was just weeping. Mm. And uh, for her, uh, the way after talking to her, the way she explained it was that the... Typically, kings and queens have their feet washed. Mm. And so her giving such dignity to these people who are living in such uh, poverty, brokenness, but treating them like kings and queens right. and in terms of who they are uh, as God's creation right. and made in the image of God, just uh, giving them dignity and getting on our knees, washing their feet, awesome. serving them that way is incredible. I'd say probably the second thing was just seeing the unity mm. around yeah. our folks serving together that yeah. we experienced was just incredible. That is incredible. That is incredible. And I, you know, you think about the heart of Jesus and go, man, is there anything that more taps into that idea uh, to serve kind of the what, but then the who to be those who maybe others would overlook um, or reject and say, no, 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 that's where believers in Christ run to. Like that's the people that, that we run to. And so um, that's really exciting. Patrick, share with us kind of when it is, how can we get involved? We'd love to participate in that way. Awesome. So I will be in the back in Connections. I forgot last service, so oh, I'll be in the did. back. Okay. Yeah. And uh, if you'd like to sign up to serve on Good Friday this year, um, actually on the tablets back there, you can sign up. There's two ways you can serve. You can wash feet. We have a limited number of spots for that. And then you can also be a tour guide. And that's someone who just greets the guests as they go through the process and you build a relationship, even have an opportunity to share the gospel as the Lord might lead. Awesome. And so those two ways you can serve on Good Friday. And then April 7th and April 14th, you'll actually have an opportunity to drop off new shoes uh, awesome. at the the back there, and that'll be a part of the experience. We'll wash their feet and then give them a new pair of shoes. That's so. fantastic. Yeah, this isn't clean your closet out, you know, and get rid of the old stuff, but it's actually buying, and, and, and that's part of the idea is that, you know, the gospel isn't, hey, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of something. It's like, I'm going to give you the very best that I have, and so... Uh, Jordan's... Yeah, Nike, no. KD's. How, can we keep this thing going? How, that's the only two shoes that's I'm aware of, so that's it. Um, we want to invite you to, to participate with that, you guys. Um, uh, over the next two Sundays, we'll have a, a box back here or something that we can drop shoes in. Um, and then on that day on Good Friday, love for you if you can. Uh, bring the family out, participate. It is a family-friendly environment. I mean, we had our kids out there, and there's meals happening, that kind of thing. And so uh, we encourage you to do that. Um, as we dismiss, Patrick, I'm going to ask if you would pray us out in just a moment. Um, it's 12.15. That means in 15 minutes, we're going to be having our street party kick off out here. So I want to encourage you to stay. Um, if you're a Horizon West Church member or you attend here regularly, uh, I want to really encourage you to engage uh, with the community as they come out. Look for opportunities to, to be that kind of winsome witness for Christ even today um, and, and to do that. And uh, so, Patrick, why don't you pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray together. Father, we want to pause, and uh, Father, I thank you for the opportunity to worship with your church that's gathered here at Horizon West, but all over the, the country and the world, really, and it's a joy. And God, your desire from the beginning was for us to be glad in you. I thank you for the mm-hmm. nations that are here in this room uh, that are glad in you and finding their joy in you. Lord, I pray that you continue to bless them so that they would be a light in this uh, city and around this world. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Amen. You guys are dismissed, and we'll see you at the street party.